Today, we are revisiting a case that is still in national headlines, actually probably international headlines, and it's because new information has recently been released. I covered this case on my channel previously, about a month ago I think it was, but since then there have been new updates, so I wanted to compile everything here for you. I know so many creators have been making videos about this case, so I promise it is not to just kind of rehash what we already went through and just one more video to check the box. We're going to talk about a lot of the newness going on now. And if you haven't guessed by now, or I guess you would know by the thumbnail, it is the case of Corey Richens. So it was only in March of this year that Corey Richens released a picture book to help children understand grief after the loss of a loved one. She supposedly wrote the book for her own sons who were struggling to cope with the devastating loss of their father, Eric. Corey took to social media and even did a book tour, and local news outlets in her home state of Utah also were promoting her book with interviews with her. And anyone who heard her story thought that she was a heartbroken wife who was trying to help her sons and keep her husband's memory alive. She had a lot of people fooled, except for Eric's family. According to them, Corey had been manipulating everyone, and she was actually a greedy, money-hungry person who poisoned Eric all for money. When she was arrested on May 8th of this year, it became national news that this seemingly meek, grieving wife and mother was now charged with the murder of her husband. Corey Richens went viral, but it wasn't for any of the reasons that she wanted or expected. On May 13th, just days after Corey was arrested, I made a video discussing the background of the Richens family and the information that we knew at that point about this case. Well, on Monday, June 12th, there was a detention hearing. This was to determine whether or not Corey should be released until the trial. And during that hearing, we found out a lot more information about this case. So today, I'm going to briefly go over what I discussed in the first video. So if you would like to hear more about their lives, their background, how they got into money, all of those things, I highly suggest watching the first one where I go more in depth about all of that, including certain altercations and things of that nature. So I will link that below and you can also find it on my playlist in the headlines. Then we're going to jump right into what went down at the detention hearing, which to everyone's surprise, basically turned into a mini trial. There is now so much new information to delve into, and as soon as it seems like we have all of the crazy details, more revelations emerge that could possibly change everyone's initial perceptions of this case. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise, this is 10 to Life. Buckle up and let's dive right in. In a world where digital threats are constantly evolving, safety becomes paramount. Safety is very important to me, especially when discussing such sensitive topics. That's where Aura, the sponsor of today's video, comes in. Aura provides all-in-one digital safety to help protect you from identity theft, financial fraud, and online threats. With Aura, you can have peace of mind knowing that your digital identity is safeguarded. Aura actively monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and even your social security number for U.S. only. If any suspicious activity is detected, Aura sends fast alerts right to your phone and email, keeping you informed and empowered to take action. Customer service is available 24-7 and based entirely in the United States, ensuring prompt and reliable assistance whenever you need it. Aura's user experience is excellent with quick action and attention to detail. Not only is Aura effective, but it's also affordable, family-friendly, and ensures that everyone gets all the same features. Your loved ones can enjoy the same level of protection, making digital safety accessible to all. Trust Aura to provide comprehensive protection against identity theft, financial fraud, and online threats. Focus on digital safety, knowing that Aura has your back like a secret best friend.
Choose Aura and experience the peace of mind that comes with having your digital identity protected. You can try Aura for a free two-week trial by going to the link Aura.com slash Annie or clicking the link in my description. Guys, it is like a digital safety best friend. I am telling you, you've got to try it. It'll give you so much peace of mind. So in my first video about this case, we learned about the life of Corey and Eric Richens, a young couple who lived in a city in Summit County, Utah. Eric came from a very well-to-do, wealthy, and respected family in Summit County. They had a huge cattle ranch, they were active in their community, and they even had buildings named for their family. They were members of the Mormon LDS Church, and Eric was said to just be an all-around amazing person. He started his own stone masonry business with his best friend Cody, and he became extremely successful as a very young entrepreneur. Corey, on the other hand, came from your typical middle-class family. She always had an amazing work ethic, sometimes having up to three different jobs at a time. She was smart, sweet, and beautiful, so it's no wonder that Eric became interested in her when they first met. They met while Corey was working at a Home Depot, and Eric would be there frequently to pick up supplies for his contracting business. After Eric finally worked up the nerve to ask Corey out, they became inseparable, and they married in 2013. On the day of their backyard wedding, it's been said that Eric's mom presented Corey with a prenuptial agreement because she didn't want her son to deal with the same financial difficulties that he did when he and his first wife had divorced. The prenup stated that neither Eric nor Corey would have any rights to present or future income or assets if they divorced, and only if one of them passed away before the other. On one life insurance policy Eric had for his company, he placed Corey and his partner Cody as beneficiaries of the policy. So if he were to pass away, Cody could use his portion of the life insurance payout to purchase Eric's share of their business. Corey, who at the time seemed to be truly in love with Eric, didn't care about the money, and she signed this agreement without hesitation. It wouldn't be until later on that her intentions seemed to change. Over the course of their nine-year marriage, Corey and Eric had three sons together, and they seemed to have the perfect, happy family. They traveled a lot, they had their kids in multiple sports, and Eric was even the assistant coach on all of his sons' teams, including basketball, baseball, and soccer. He was said to love helping kids and cared about all of the kids that he coached. During their marriage, Corey started her own real estate company, and she would also buy inexpensive houses to flip and then sell for a greater profit. She also started her own cleaning company and had employees who worked for her and would clean the investment properties that she purchased. Her business was picking up traction and seemed to be going very well, but it would be discovered later that Corey and her business were in serious financial trouble and in the bad graces of several hard money lenders. In 2020, Eric and Corey took a trip to Greece, and I talk about this in much more detail on my previous video, but to just give you a quick little history of what happened on that trip, after Corey made Eric a drink, he got extremely ill. And from that point on, he had a feeling that Corey was trying to poison him. At the time, that seemed like a huge assumption to make from just getting sick off of one drink, but we would learn later that there could have been more issues going on in their marriage that caused Eric to think that Corey did in fact want to get back at him for something. After this Greece trip, in November 2020, he decided to draw up a living trust without telling Corey. He transferred his family home, all of his personal property, and his share of the masonry business into the trust, and he made his sister the sole beneficiary. He supposedly wanted to make sure that if anything were ever to happen to him, all of his assets would go to his children, and he knew that his sister would follow his wishes. During this rocky patch of their marriage, Eric's family and friends all said that even though he was miserable in his marriage, he wouldn't want to divorce Corey because he didn't want to risk not getting to see his sons every day. The most important thing to him was keeping his family together and keeping his sons happy, even if that meant staying in an unhappy marriage. He apparently was even willing to stay in a marriage where he was in fear for his life. A large mansion in Summit County known as the Grand House went up for sale, which caused more tension between Corey and Eric. Corey wanted to purchase the house to flip it and make a profit, but Eric felt like it was way too expensive, so they continued to argue about this decision. Then in January of 2022, Eric and his business partner Cody got a notification from the online portal of their business life insurance policy. 
The notification said that someone had logged in and was tinkering with the details of the policy. Supposedly, Corey removed Cody and placed herself as the sole beneficiary. This seriously alarmed both Eric and Cody, but they quickly were able to switch it back without Corey's knowledge, and Eric never confronted her about it. Between December of 2021 and February of 2022, court documents stated that Corey had conversations with an acquaintance of hers, who the documents referred to as CL, in which Corey requested $1,300 worth of prescription pain medication, all for an investor client she had who was having back pain. On two occasions, Corey received pain medication from this CL person, which was allegedly fentanyl, an opioid 100 times stronger than morphine. On February 14th, 2022, Valentine's Day, it was said that Eric became sick after eating a sandwich that Corey had prepared for him as a Valentine's Day little treat. He reported getting hives and having shortness of breath and suspected again that Corey had tried to poison him. He reportedly told his sisters after that incident, if anything ever happened to him, Corey was to blame. His sisters have stated that during this time, Eric was seriously contemplating divorce, but other friends have said that they believed that Eric and Corey were actually in a good place in their marriage at the time. It's not clear if Eric felt like he was possibly overreacting or if he was truly in fear for his life, because the people closest to him all have different accounts about the status of their marriage. About two weeks after the Valentine's Day incident, Corey allegedly requested another $900 worth of pain medication from her acquaintance friend, CL. It was said that Corey left money for CL in a fire pit at one of the investment properties that she owned, and she asked that the pills be placed there for her to pick up later. During this time, Eric had entertained Corey's idea about purchasing that Midway mansion, and they were even under contract for the home, but nothing had been finalized yet. Eric reportedly told his family that he was going to break it to Corey that they weren't actually going to buy the house because it was just too expensive. It didn't make sense, which if you look at the massive amount of debt that Corey's business was in at the time, it makes a lot of sense. However, it's possible that she thought that the house could be what got her out of that debt. Regardless, according to Corey on March 3rd, the couple closed on the home. She said that she was excited and she wanted to celebrate with her husband so she made him a Moscow Mule cocktail and brought it to him in bed. He also allegedly ate a THC gummy, but while they were talking, one of their sons apparently woke up from a night terror, so Corey said that she went into his room to comfort him and ended up falling asleep in their son's bed until about 3 a.m. She woke up and headed back to her and Eric's room, but when she got in bed, she felt that Eric was cold to the touch. She said she called 911 and attempted to perform CPR before the paramedics arrived. The paramedics noted that after they attempted CPR, Eric started foaming at the mouth, which led them to believe that Corey hadn't actually tried CPR before they arrived, or else he would have already had foam in his mouth from her attempts. Just after 3.30 a.m., Eric was pronounced as dead. During his autopsy, Eric was found to have five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system. Eric's family and even Corey were all adamant that he didn't have a drug problem or ever use drugs recreationally, and they didn't find any trace of fentanyl or other drugs anywhere in the home. It's been said that the very next day after Eric's death, Corey threw a party at their home, and she was drinking and still celebrating the closing of that Midway mansion. Corey's friends and Eric's sister were in attendance of this party, and his sister felt like Corey wasn't acting as sad as someone whose husband literally just died would be. Corey tried to file a claim alleging that Eric defrauded her and had no right to transfer his assets as outlined in their prenup, and she also sued his sister for an additional 300 grand. Katie countersued Corey and cited that her brother's death happened under suspicious circumstances and included that it was being investigated as a possible murder. Apparently to investigators, the evidence of Eric's death didn't point to him attempting to take his own life or it being an accident and they felt like Corey must have poisoned him. Their theory became even stronger when they got information from Eric's family and data from Corey's phone. Over the course of a year, they worked behind the scenes to build a case against Corey and try to find out what really happened to Eric. However, during the same time, Corey was thinking like she just got away with murder, apparently, and she wrote a book called Are You With Me?, 
which was a children's book to help kids grieve after the loss of a loved one. She went on a campaign to paint herself as a grieving widow who just wanted to help her sons going through this unimaginable grief. It became even more unimaginable when their mother, Corey, was arrested for allegedly murdering Eric by fentanyl poisoning on May 8th, 2022. So that's where we were up to at the point of my very first video. Again, it went into way more detail about the grease trip, about the poisoning attempts, about the altercations with the family members, but that was the information that we had up until that point. The potential of someone masquerading around pretending to be grief-stricken and using the grief of her own children to promote book sales became national news immediately. It was even more shocking to learn that Corey may have been the one to cause his death in the first place. On June 12th, cameras were let inside the court to stream Corey's detention hearing, and like I said before, it seriously turned out to be a mini-trial of sorts. Even though there was no jury, the prosecution had to present evidence that they had to the judge so that he would hopefully decide not to let her out on bail while awaiting trial. They called three witnesses, and we got a lot more insight into what is really going on with this case, and what the trial is probably going to be like. The defense got to question the witnesses as well, and the hearing lasted nearly four hours before the judge made his decision. There was so much more new information in there and clarifications that helped some of what we learned before make much more sense. So I'm going to go over the highlights of the hearing with you and give you my thoughts about some of the things that were said and what we can expect going forward with the trial. First of all, the courtroom was absolutely packed with family and friends of both Eric and Corey. Some of Eric's employees who worked for his stone masonry company came and showed their support in their work uniforms, which just shows how much he was loved, even as a boss. Even though Corey was able to wear street clothes, her hands were shackled to her waist, and she looked a little different than the well-put-together woman that we've seen in so many of their family photos. The first witness to be called was the lead detective on the case, Jeff O'Driscoll. He was actually not the first lead detective on the case because apparently the first detective was removed and reprimanded for the mishandling of something. I do want to say that the WebEx stream of the hearing was extremely glitchy, so it was hard to hear everything that they were saying. Detective O'Driscoll discussed the acquaintance, CL, which we actually learned was someone who cleaned Corey's family home and worked for her in her cleaning investment properties business. CL was known to law enforcement to be a drug distributor and was on a court-mandated recovery program for parole during their investigation. While investigating what happened to Eric, they ended up raiding CL's home and found drugs and a firearm, which all went against the stipulations of her parole. She was arrested, and while in custody, the detectives told her that she was on the hook for four potential first-degree felonies, which had the potential of a life sentence and even new federal charges. They told her that she needed to cooperate with them, but in her initial interview, she told them that Corey never asked her for fentanyl and that she only gave her hydrocodone. They basically used new charges as leverage to get more information out of her, which Detective O'Driscoll said is a very common tactic for law enforcement. She was told that she needed to provide enough specific information for the prosecution to use in order to get a conviction against Corey for murder. Much of the information she had a hard time remembering, until the detectives showed her phone data and sort of guided her through what happened. Corey's defense attorney, Sky Lazaro, said that the only reason CL decided to help was because the detectives told her it would be her get-out-of-jail-free card. However, the detective said he didn't use those words. Oddly enough, the defense believes that there is a video recording of him saying that exact quote. Tell CL that she needs to give good enough details that will ensure that Corey gets convicted of murder, correct? I don't know if I made that specific statement, but I did express to her that the information that she gave us needed to be specific enough that we could corroborate it and that it could be presented to a courtroom. Okay. And that she was, quote, screwed at this point years if there's not cooperation, correct? No, I never made such statement. Okay. Did you ever tell her this was her get-out-of-jail-free card? No, I did not. Okay. Are you sure about that? Yes. 
The defense believes that the only way that CL was able to give them the information they needed is because they fed her the information that they wanted her to say. But the prosecution said that they have much, much more evidence than just CL's statements. They also said that CL came to pick up a check from Corey, but the defense argued that the check could have just been for Corey paying her for her cleaning services and that there were never any witnesses or specific text messages found that explicitly show her receiving fentanyl from CL. At, at that time, from my understanding of what CL told us, she was cleaning only investment properties belonging to the Richens Realty Company. And she was getting compensated for that, correct? Yes. Okay, and so the check that you issued the search warrant on for the bank, that was written from Corey's business account, correct? Correct. Okay, so... It could very well be that Corey was paying her for cleaning houses, correct? I don't want to speculate, but... It could be, it's despite possible. what CL said, correct? Okay. CL had at first told Detective O'Driscoll that she didn't remember where she took the fentanyl the second time. But after they showed her the house with the fire pit, she said that she remembered taking it there. She now says that... Uh, it was specifically fentanyl that Corey asked for, correct? Correct. <laughs> and that she didn't actually take the pills to that house in Midway. It was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, correct? Like I said, she went back and forth on her memory on which instances referred to which transactions. Acquaintance three, was that in regard to that transaction? No was the second transaction. Were you ever to corroborate, was anyone with her that could corroborate that she saw CL hand Corey drugs? Not that I know of. Third transaction that occurred after Eric's death, correct? She didn't make the statement that it was after Eric's death, but she told us there were three total transactions. So the information contained in the state's amended information, you don't know where that came from. Which information are you referring to? That she purchased drugs after Eric's death. Yes, I do know where it came from. Okay. Um, and you're saying CL did not sell drugs to Corey after Eric's death? CL could not remember specific dates and did not make mention that the transaction happened after Eric's death. But when presented with digital evidence, from other witnesses, she confirmed that that was most likely correct. Okay. So she just agreed with your scenario of events, correct? No. In fact, several times during our interview, she told us that as we presented her more information, it helped her remember more. Okay. So as you're telling her to be more specific, you're providing her with information that you're gaining in the and she's saying, now I remember. Accurate? However, defense attorney Sky Lazaro argued that the house that CL claimed to have taken the pills to in February was actually closed on and sold back in January, so Corey would no longer have access to that home. She couldn't give us an address, but she was confident that she could find it if she could drive there. Okay. And did you take her for a drive there? Yes. Okay. Did you ever do any follow-up investigation on uh, whether or not that house uh, ever sold? Yes. Okay. And you know that that house sold sometime in January of 2022, correct? What I understand, yes. Okay. So Ms. Richens no longer owned that home or <coughs> occupied that home or had access to that home in February, correct? I don't know. Well, the house was owned by somebody else, right? Again, I don't know. Well, you said it closed in January of 2022. From the information that I was told from other people, other investigators that had looked into that, I was told that Ms. Richens owned the house at some point and that it sold at some point. I don't know dates exactly. It would be important if uh, CL's telling you that she had access to the home and was there in February? Possibly. That might be a good fact to know. 
The defense brought up interviews with two of Eric's best friends, and the detective said that neither of them said that Eric thought Corey was trying to poison him. They talked about how they all confided in each other about problems in their marriages, and that Eric had said that they were in a really great place around the time of his death. Detective Driscoll asked him why if they were in such a good place, why wouldn't he change the beneficiary of his estate back from his sister to Corey? And he said that even though they were in a good place right now, if Corey did ever file for a divorce, he wanted to get the last word in, a direct quote. The defense also asked about a very interesting point of the interview with his friends regarding a recent visit to Mexico for a hunting trip. Eric was very into sport hunting, and apparently when you go on these hunting tourism trips, a guide or an outfitter in Mexico secures the permits for the hunters to be able to kill a certain amount and take back a certain amount of animals. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know much about hunting, but I guess you have to have permits for all of the animals that you plan on killing and taking home. Well, reportedly, Eric had paid their outfitter very, very well, but he didn't apply for enough permits. The hunting group wasn't aware of that until after the fact, so they ended up killing and taking home many more animals than they had permits for, which can apparently get you in a lot of legal trouble. Eric reportedly had a couple of very heated conversations with this outfitter from Mexico, and on the night that he passed away, he even searched how long it would take for him to drive from their home to where this outfitter lived in Mexico so that they could meet face to face. According to Eric's friends, this outfitter had ties to the Mexican cartel, and they thought that there could have been some correlation between that and Eric's death. The defense asked Detective O'Driscoll an interesting question. The question was that if Corey told the investigators that she had made Eric a drink, why didn't anyone try to collect a drink glass for evidence? The detective, who, like I mentioned, came on the case later, told the defense that he wasn't sure about that. However, the prosecution pointed out that on the body cam footage, you can see that there was no glass in the bedroom to collect. So if there really was no glass, that's pretty damning evidence for Corey, who maybe didn't actually bring him a drink in the room like she said, or maybe she tried to clean up that room and cleaned the glass, which would all go against what she said of immediately calling 911. And she told them that she had made a drink, correct? Correct. Okay, so they were aware of that. Um, was there anything in that body cam or investigation uh, that talks about them looking for a glass that a drink had been made in? No. Okay. Um, but you said that they searched for illicit drugs, correct? I don't know if they searched for illicit drugs, but they searched the home. Okay. So they searched the home that night knowing that he had a drink right before he went to bed uh, and made no note that they had recovered glasses, looked for glasses, anything along those lines, correct? Not to my understanding. Okay. They said that the only evidence that Eric did have a drink was Corey saying that he did. Previously, there had been a discrepancy on whether or not Corey found Eric on the floor or in the bed, because she said that she felt like he was cold when she laid next to him. This was all spelled out for everyone when Detective O'Driscoll said that the 911 dispatcher told her to use the blanket to move him from the bed to the floor so that she could conduct CPR. He said that the EMS noted that since foam came up from Eric's mouth when they did CPR, it appeared that Corey hadn't tried. However, the defense asked if it was possible that someone who had never done CPR before could do it wrong, and he said yes. So that makes me wonder because I remember several articles saying that Corey used to work at a hospital. I'm not sure in what capacity she worked at a hospital, but it would be interesting to find out if she was ever CPR certified or not. Detective O'Driscoll discussed the altercation between Corey and Eric's sister and what actually took place that morning. The detective said that when searching the house, they found something called bug bags, which were backpacks all labeled with each person of the family's name and had survival-type supplies in them, also travel documents like the children's IDs, and Corey and Eric's bags had their passports and things like that. This made the detective feel like Corey could have possibly been a flight risk or had been planning on leaving with the children. But the defense said that if she were planning on doing those things, why would Eric's bag be in there too? Also, she stated that the travel documents and IDs were all expired, so those bug bags were made a long time ago and wouldn't have been made or useful to use recently or to flee. 
She also said that in Utah, it's very common for people to do this kind of prep, like doomsday prep, creating stockpiles just to have these bags ready to go just in case something happens. Personally, I have a few friends who do have these bags in their homes as well. Detective O'Driscoll then talked about the first time that he went to see Corey in person, and he asked her if she remembered him because Eric had previously coached his son. The prosecution called an expert who had analyzed Corey's phone, and he said that there was a lot of missing text message and phone call data. He said that when reviewing the logs from the phone company, there was a record of calls and texts being made that had been deleted from her phone. He said that there was evidence from phone data tracking that a device like an Apple Watch or a phone made significant movements and text messages that were deleted before the 911 call was placed. This would mean that Corey was actually not sleeping like she claimed and that she did not immediately call 911 when she found Eric dead. She estimated that Corey waited up to 15 minutes to call 911. So what was she doing during that time frame? There were also several Google searches that have raised a lot of red flags as well. To be honest, some of her searches do sound a little like Letitia Stauk. I really don't understand how people don't get at this point that anything you search can be found, whether you delete it or not. All of these searches were made after her original phone was taken, so she knew that she was being investigated at this point. So she searched, what is the lethal dose of fentanyl? Luxury prisons for the rich in America? Death certificate says pending? Will life insurance still pay? Can cops force you to do a lie detector test? how to permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely, all pretty damning searches if you ask me. An innocent person, a grieving widow, doesn't really make those kinds of searches in my opinion, especially luxury prisons for the rich people in America. Like, if that doesn't scream privilege and delusion, I don't know what does. One of her defense attorneys said that she was just researching her case to see how evidence was processed, which, okay. We begin with some exclusive details that have now surfaced in the Corey Richens case. She's the Utah author who wrote a children's book on grief and then later was accused of murdering her husband. She's expected to appear in court on Monday. ABC4's Elena Castro, live in studio with the latest. Uncovered Google searches now painting a picture of where Corey Richard's head may have been in the days following her husband's death. Searches like Women Utah Prison, How to Turn Off Find My iPhone, and Can You Delete Everything Off an iCloud Account. The searches continue with questions asking how to completely wipe an iPhone remotely and can the cause of death be changed on a death certificate. Criminal defense attorney Clayton Sims gives us an attorney's perspective on what she may have been doing. What she's doing is she's just researching her case. She's looking at, at how evidence is processed, how the FBI processes a cell phone. Can messages be deleted? Can Facebook be deleted? Maybe she's, she's trying to understand what the time frame is. You know, how long is it gonna take for the FBI to investigate this? How long is it gonna take for the police to investigate this? So these are, again, Google searches after the death. According to Corey's history, she read articles that would certainly cause people to question. An article from Vox titled, Police Can't Read Your Messages, But Here's What They Can See. Another article from Bladen Online with the headline, Delay in Claim Payment for Death Certificate with Pending Cause of Death. Sims adding that this adds to the picture of her case and where she may have been mentally at the time. Some of the articles were, can you overdose on fentanyl? Can you overdose on a single pill of fentanyl? These are things that she may want to look at. If, if she's accused of that, she may want to see if that's possible. So I, I don't think it's insignificant. I think her state of mind, what she's looking at, what she's researching could be important. Uh, but certainly I think there's nothing there that indicates guilt. Corey's hearing is this Monday, where they will discuss whether she's a flight risk or a danger to the community. Even if that's true, I don't really see why she would need to know if you could delete information from an iPhone remotely or how luxury prisons would help her case and help decipher how evidence is being processed. Make it make sense. Just out of curiosity. But you know, I'm a curious person. So just out of curiosity, I googled luxury prisons for the rich in America. And well, I'm sorry, but there aren't any, Corey. Based on the prosecution's last witness, who was a financial expert, Corey was far from rich. The expert found that all of Corey's accounts were overdrawn and her credit lines were maxed out, and that in total, 
she owed about $4 million to hard money lenders who had given her short-term loans for houses that she had planned to flip and sell. The expert said that Corey knew that Eric was worth a lot more dead than alive because if they divorced, Corey wouldn't get anything from him, not a single penny. However, she believed that if he died, she would get all of the assets from his estate. The only problem was she wasn't aware that Eric had switched everything over to his sister. She also revealed that Eric had a total of six life insurance policies taken out for him and even for their children. It's thought that Corey forged Eric's signature for some of these policies, and he wasn't even aware of them. And then there's um, there's a life insurance policy that um, Eric and his business partner had on each other, basically, and that's uh, in coordination with a buy-sell agreement on their business. And so if one of them passes away, the other would be the beneficiary of that life insurance. Um, what was the amount... Uh, uh, money that um, Eric's life was insured for um, at the time of his death? About $1.2 million, aside from the business buy-sell policy. And are you familiar with any any uh, um, any attempt to beneficiary of the business policy? I'm aware that that is the report, yes. And what was the report? That on uh, New Year's Day of 2022, that in New York Life's um, online portal, someone had logged in and had changed the beneficiaries on that um, on that policy. To questions. Okay. And that was changed back, as far as you know, at the t uh, had been changed back at the time of Eric's death. That's my understanding. Yes. Do okay. you know how much money uh, the defendant got in insurance payouts? $1.3 million, a little bit, a little bit more than that, $1.3 million in June of 2022. Her defense argued that it wouldn't have made any sense for Corey to kill Eric for financial reasons, because even the amount of the life insurance policy wouldn't have been enough to cover her debts, and him being alive and helping her with the money problems would have been more beneficial for her. So the last person to speak was a representative for the Richens family. And that was Eric's sister. Her statement was absolutely heartbreaking. And she asked that the judge not release Corey on bail because she believes that Eric's sons are in danger and that Corey would stop at nothing to get the money that she wants, even if it meant committing murder. His life was taken in a senseless act of poisoning on March 3rd, 2022. His wife, the defendant, has been accused of committing this crime. If she is found guilty, she has committed the ultimate act of betrayal. Eric is gone, and I am brokenhearted. He was my best friend and protector. The feeling of loss is so great it is visceral. And with the sorrow comes a wave of panic at not being able to see him again. I can never talk to him, never hug him again, and never more be a part of his life. Eric's world revolved around his family, his love for hunting, the family cattle ranch, and his intense drive as a successful entrepreneur. Being born into the Richens' legacy shaped Eric's formative years and resulted in a lifetime of hard work, dedication, and fierce loyalty. At an early age, Eric learned the joys of keeping horses and cows around. His losses created a Grand Canyon-sized hole in this community. Except instead of taking millions of years to slowly form, our worlds change open, overnight. His three boys' entire worlds and their perspectives on life changed. None of our lives will ever be the same. Eric died under horrendous circumstances. I am tormented at the thought of what he endured. I play it out in my mind. I go through the terrible sequence of events. I wonder when he realized he was in mortal danger. What may have said to him in his last moments. How long was he conscious, knowing he would die? Where were did they hear Eric's body fall to the ground? Did they catch a glimpse of their father taking his last breath? It's torture to think of. Why did Eric lose his life? Why did the boys lose their father? Was it because of Corey's greed and desire to get life insurance and other assets? If so, that is abhorrent. How could anyone value human life so cheaply? I cannot comprehend it. 
I'm overflowing with grief and, grief and pain at the thought that Eric meant so little to her. If Eric had died because of an illness, he would have been cared for. He could have looked after him and been with him. If he had died because of an accident, people would have tried to help. There would have been kindness. But there's no to be had here. There's no concern. In his last moments, after being intentionally poisoned, he was faced with betrayal and terror. The thought of it is unbearable. I am haunted by the horror of it. It has been a living hell for our family. We have watched as Corey has paraded around portraying herself as a grieving window, widow and victim while trying to profit from the death of my brother. Both by trying to profit from a book about his death and trying to get life insurance and ask that should go exactly where Eric wanted them to, to his voice. Immediately after he killed, Corey told us she could not help us get anything ready for the funeral as she was too distraught with grief. We shortly found out that was not true at all. In fact, she pulled herself off to go close on the purchase of a $2 million home, hire a real estate agent, hire an architect to create CAD drawings of the home, hire a lawyer in order to file a lawsuit on Eric's trust, hire a locksmith to come break into and clean out my brother's safe, and attempt to have Eric cremated. She mustered up the strength and resolve to do most of this within 48 hours of his death. Corey assaulted me. I will never forget the look in her eyes when she attacked me that Sunday morning. It was early and had been snowing most of the night. I was just getting ready to leave and heading out to the car when I saw a locksmith in Eric's detached garage starting to drill out his gun safe. I asked Corey multiple times why we could not just call my dad for the code. I could not understand why she was breaking into and ruining Eric's safe. To this, she screamed at me at the top of her lungs, called me some inappropriate things I cannot share with you here, and then told me to get out of her house. It was then that I told her that she could not kick me out of my brother's house. My sister, Katie, was now the executor of Eric's trust and estate, and just like Eric, she would not want the defendant breaking into his gun safe. Corey looked at me with pure hatred and rage. I was messing up her plan. I was getting in her way. And because of that, she attacked me. Multiple times. It took four people to pull her off me that day. Before the funeral, funeral Corey opened a bank account and asked everyone that was grieving to send her money instead of sending the family cards and flowers two weeks after Eric's passing that we were told she had taken down my brother and removed all his clothing from the house. Corey put together a golf tournament in Eric's name two months after his death on what would have been his 40th birthday and told his family, all of us, that we were not allowed to attend. Since Eric's death, it has come to our attention that Corey took out multiple life insurance policies on Eric without his knowledge. It appears that she forged his signature on various documents, assigned herself as Eric's durable power of attorney, inappropriately diverted money from his business to herself, and assigned herself as beneficiary of Eric's portion of our mother's retirement account. I should also no not forget to mention the multiple life insurances she has taken out on the boys. Her most recent business venture was authoring a children's book about how to help grieving children cope with the loss of the death of a parent. In this book, she had the audacity to use the boys' real names and even use their last family portrait. Her behavior gives me great concern as she has exploited the boys for money and will likely do so again. In addition, Corey has weaponized Eric's children, manipulating my dad to do or not do things by threatening to come in to cut him out of their lives if he, did, if he did not capitulate to her demands. She similarly deprived the boys of contact with myself, my sister, and her daughters unless we agreed to give her the money in Eric's trust, money that Eric wanted to go to his three children. As if that were not enough, 
I've been told that Corey started telling their three little boys that none of Eric's family or friends loved them. She apparently told them none of us cared for them or wanted to be around them, even though that is the exact opposite of what was happening. We all want nothing more than to be there for those three little boys, my nephews, yet Corey has made sure to cut us out of every aspect of their lives. This is all just a brief summary and the start of what our family has been through over the last year. We have scarcely gone a day without finding out some new allegations or evidence regarding something Corey appears to have maliciously done to attack and undermine my brother, his three little boys, and our family. We have all been there since the beginning of Corey's and Eric's relationship. I was there on one of their first dates. We were there at the wedding. We were there when each of the boys were born. We understand that she has defaulted on loans and is already a defendant in other lawsuits based on her financial misdeeds. I am truly concerned that she will stop at nothing to dig her way out of the problems, including murder. She seems devoid of moral sensibility and there is no telling what she will do if she is released. Judge Mrazic, her fate lies in your hands. Please do not allow Corey to use the fraudulent life insurance proceeds to get out on bail. That would be morally reprehensible. Please do not allow Corey to take advantage and make a mockery of our justice and legal system anymore. She has done enough. Please do not allow Corey to hurt Eric's memory, our family, friends, and community anymore. We have been through enough. Please do not give Corey the opportunity to hurt Eric's three boys anymore. They have lost enough and have been through enough. Since Eric's death, we have learned and unfortunately are continually reminded that Corey is desperate, greedy, and extremely manipulative. Out on bail, I will be afraid not only for my own life and those of all of my family, but most for the lives of Eric's three sons. He has already suffered enough. Please do not let Corey out on bail where she will be a risk to do further harm. Please protect what Eric put his life on the line for his three boys. Thank you. Amy, thank you. Ms. Cassell. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lazaro, is the defense calling any witnesses? I am not. Before the judge gave his decision, both the defense and the prosecution gave a version of closing statements of sorts. And Corey's team stated that this CL person was not a credible source of information. And it seems like her whole account was led by information from Detective O'Driscoll, all just to get out of jail. She had been released even with all of those potential charges and even a federal charge. There's no independent witness to corroborate that CL gave Ms. Corey those drugs, correct? No eyewitnesses that we have identified, but the investigation is ongoing. And CL is currently out of custody, right? Depends on your definition of custody, but she's not incarcerated, no. Not incarcerated. She's on, I think, ankle monitor and not to leave the county, right? Correct. But following your interviews with her, she was released from jail? Not immediately, no. She worked with the prosecutor in the other county where her drug court is and came to a resolution as to those charges against her, and part of that was being released on ankle monitor. Okay, so in exchange for the testimony, or in, not testimony, in exchange for the information that she provided to you, and a deal was worked out where she was placed, essentially released from jail on the order to show cause, correct? I don't know the specifics of what went on between the prosecutor and CL. But subsequent to our interviews, we reached out to the prosecutor's office and let them know that she was being cooperative. After that, I was not involved in any decisions regarding her release. Okay, because that's up to the judge and whatnot. But, but you did communicate that to prosecutors? Yes. That she gave you the information you needed? That she was being cooperative with our investigation, okay. yes. The defense was insinuating that it's obvious that they did work out a deal with her. He said that there was no proof of Corey ever specifically requesting fentanyl or proof of CL giving any to her. She loved her kids. She loved her husband. Um, but she's also charged 
now with his murder. Um, and so I just don't necessarily want that to get lost on the court that we understand the gravity of the situation. Um, with regard to the evidence, I, I'm going to skip through most of it. I think the most important thing, if she poisoned him, is did she ever get it from CL? Was it ever requested from CL? I don't think the state has been able to draw that nexus. I don't disagree that CL was buying drugs. I think that's clear. Um, she has a history of being a drug distributor. She was jammed in first degree felonies. She had a potential federal case hanging over her. And you know, then when they look at her phone, they find evidence of additional drug distribution. We knew charge. Um, Pursuant to essentially the detective's testimony is they walked her down the line of, I need more evidence. This is what we need to know. And, and provided evidence to her essentially until she got it right. And then she was released. Uh, when we look at the cell phone mapping, um, yes, we know she went and picked up a check. We know that she was cleaning houses. We know she cashed a check. We know she picked up drugs but they can't put her anywhere in the same vicinity of Corey's phone. Because apparently the mapping's not available from Verizon, which somewhat surprises me, given it's Verizon. I think it's a length but, of time between the events and the request. Correct. Um, but they don't, they have things about her, her buying and selling fentanyl. They have zero corroborating evidence for anything or giving it to Corey. She didn't tell anybody that she was buying it for Corey. She uh, never had anybody with her when she dropped it off. Uh, there's, there's nothing to make the most important correlation in this, and that's that it was ever provided to Corey that Corey it. There was no fentanyl or traces of fentanyl found in the home anywhere. Um, and I think that's significant. I think if she gotten 30 pills on at least two separate occasions, that's a lot of fentanyl. I mean, if, one, if, if one's lethal, right, we're talking about a lot of fentanyl, and nothing is found, no traces anywhere, absolutely nothing. So I, I think the state's making a big leap in their evidence by saying, look, we, we have this girl, we know, she's, we know she's a drug dealer, we know she's buying fentanyl, uh, but... There's nothing to corroborate anything she says that ties it to Corey. Um, the glass, you know, Corey tells them she made him a drink, right? The glass is there. No one, no one thinks to bother to, to. Where's the evidence that the glass is present? Well, I didn't look for a glass. I guess is what I should say. Okay. So no glass was tested. So there's nothing to show that Corey did anything to Eric. Detective O'Driscoll's testimony, it could have been accidental. I mean, it very well could have. And I think that, given the evidence presented today, is a very plausible situation. With money does not make you a murderer. Being, being bad at, at managing your accounts, just, I mean, makes you, makes you bad at math, but it doesn't make you a murderer. The other thing I think that's significant is, if by the testimony that came out today, the hard money loans that she owed, at least, far exceeded life insurance policy. And so even getting the life insurance money was not going to solve Corey's problems, not even close to solving her problems. Uh, and so that evidence alone, while you know maybe there's some other issues uh, with Corey's business, uh, there's nothing to tie it uh, to her having any motive or in any way being in a better position from Eric's death. In fact, she's in a worse position because of his death because Eric had a business. He was continually making money. You know, he was, you know, from what it sounds like, the, the majority of the contributions into the joint account. So his death, from a financial perspective, has harmed her far more 
than any money that she gained from any life insurance. Um, that um, I'll largely submit on the remainder of our briefing as I trust the court is. I have carefully. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Cassell. Thank you, Your Honor. The prosecution's rebuttal was that they did have a significant amount of evidence that she got fentanyl from CL and that the only reason they didn't see her specifically asking for it was because Corey deleted her messages. And they said that she staged the scene where Eric was found, which is why there was no glass found from a Moscow mule. They said that she thought that by killing Eric, she would have gotten a lot more money, but the only reason she didn't is because of the changes that Eric made to his policies without her knowledge. And I think one of the things that we have that, that's said is, you know, she, that she was she was primed and 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 told to uh, told what to say. But but what really happened is she's you know a year later she's asked to consider what. You know, if she remembered anything else, and she came back with, "Yeah, I remember more. I remember more." And that's very typical of, of witnesses. It's typical of people that we have testify. And then just the—I mean, you heard all of the corroborating evidence, Your Honor. The matching with the cell phone, with the mapping. Uh, do we have the the uh, uh, her put CL putting the the drug in uh, in, in uh, Corey's hands? We do. We have a hand-to-hand -hand that that, uh, that uh, was testified to. So we have the evidence that that, uh, that that Corey got or the defendant got the drugs. We also have the evidence that corroborates all or most of CL's story. It, we would have more if there weren't uh, texts uh, that were deleted. We have a, a great deal of information that was deleted, and that was deleted off of the defendant's phone. Uh, and, so I think that that uh, is sufficient evidence just for, for uh, CL and that makes CL credible. Um, the idea that no glass was tested, well, if you look at the pictures that we have uh, submitted, there's nothing there. It's a stage scene. How, how they, they can argue that, that Eric somehow consumed this himself, there's no glass, there's no baggies, there's nothing that this was ever, ever taken by Eric. And also to say it's accidental, uh, one or two pills might be accidental. 20 or five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. That is a, that, that is someone who, who wants Eric dead. And the person who benefited the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. Or the person who thought she was going to benefit the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. She thought she was going to be entitled to Eric's estate. She didn't know that there was this trust that had put the money into into uh, Katie Richens thought on the day that Eric died that she was the one that was going to benefit. She benefited from the insurance policies. She thought she was going to benefit from more. And she uh, thought she was going to benefit from Eric's estate. She tried to benefit from the other uh, uh, life insurance policy on Eric's uh, business. Didn't, that didn't happen. She also was in dire financial straits, Your Honor, writing checks on closed accounts or checks with, with no money in them. I know you cut me off. It was because, in your brief. I got right, it. I, I, thank you. I understand. But uh, that's significant because she was in dire financial straits. She was, she was, she was uh, deep in debt. And the way to get out of that debt was to kill Eric Richens. She benefited financially, and she had a, many cases, and we talk about this all the time. Prosecutors say we don't need motive. This case has motive. This case has motive that she... Uh, needed to get out of this debt, and that's the reason she killed Eric in hopes of getting his estate, in hopes of getting his, his life insurance policies, and, that's, and that, Your Honor, we believe is substantial evidence. All right. And here is what the judge had to say about it. Well, at the time of Eric's death, defendant's subjective understanding was that she would get a greater share of the marital estate if Eric died during the marriage, as opposed to what she would receive under the premarital agreement if the parties divorced. Moreover, evidence uh, admitted in the case shows that in the months leading to Eric's death, defendant's personal and business accounts were overdrawn. She was making significant recurring debt payments, many of which were to hard money lenders, 
and that her lines of credit or lines of credit credit available to her were maxed out. And at the time of his death, Eric's life was insured for approximately $1.2 million, not including the policy related to the buy-sell agreement, with defendant listed as the beneficiary. Moreover, we have evidence from which a jury could reasonably infer consciousness of guilt. We have evidence regarding the search uh, that was extracted from defendant's second phone after her first phone was seized. And then we have inconsistent uh, made by defendant as compared to other evidence in the case regarding whether she called 911 immediately whether she performed CPR, whether she did something else for the 15 minutes between discovering uh, Eric dead and calling 911. In considering this evidence, a jury could reasonably choose to discount and find unpersuasive defendants' efforts to poke holes in the state's case, and in so doing, a reasonable jury could reach a verdict of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt on the charge of aggravated murder based on the state's evidence. For these reasons, the is there is substantial evidence to support the capital felony charge of aggravated murder against the defendant in this case. Having made that determination, the court considers whether it has discretion to grant defendant bail, notwithstanding that she has no right to bail under Article 1, Section 8 of the Utah Constitution. Desperate acts that might include harming themselves, harming the members of their family, or harming witnesses in the case. Because an incentive this powerful cannot be adequately managed in the community, it weighs heavily against granting any form of pretrial release. Second, the state has offered substantial evidence the defendant procured fentanyl on more than one occasion, and on at least one occasion, deployed that fentanyl to cause the death of another person. As a general matter, an individual who is capable of this kind of decision making is not a good candidate for supervision in the community. More specifically, given the uniquely dangerous nature of fentanyl, which has been demonstrated tragically by events in Summit County, Defendant's alleged conduct, as supported by substantial evidence, is especially dangerous. Indeed, these circumstances constitute clear and convincing evidence that defendant would pose a substantial danger to the community if released on bail, a substantial danger that cannot be adequately managed by any combination of conditions of pretrial release that are available in Summit County. For these reasons, the court finds the circumstances of this case as supported by substantial evidence, weighs soundly against any form of pretrial release. The state's motion for detention is granted. Defendant Corey Darden Richens shall continue to be detained without during the time she awaits trial or other resolution of the criminal charges against her. Ms. Richens, you have the right to an expedited appeal of the you must file a notice of appeal within 30 days of the court's ruling, and you have the right to be represented by counsel on that appeal. So Corey Richens is now being held without bail until her trial. And in this case, it really seems like things are going to go relatively quickly. The judge said that since Corey is being held until trial, he wants it to go as soon as possible, and some analysts think that it could be as soon as six to eight months. I think the fact that she has three boys who she took life insurance policies out on has a lot to do with his decision, especially since his family truly believes they aren't safe if their mother was willing to do what they are alleging that she did. This hearing kind of gave us a sample of what's going to happen in court and what each side's stance will be. However, even after the hearing, more information is coming out. They could once again change the direction of this case and where it's going entirely. There was an email released on the Corey Richens case discussion Facebook group, and I wanted to get some further confirmation that they were real before talking too much about them, because you really never know what's real, what's fake on Facebook. But several media outlets have now published the email as well, which, 
gives them a little bit more legitimacy in my opinion, but just keep in mind that everything is still alleged at this point, whether mass media outlets have distributed it or not. The emails are Corey alleging that Eric had an affair and that they were undergoing marriage counseling. She also stated that Eric didn't want her working and wanted to be the primary breadwinner and have her stay at home. The email states, Hey there, I thought I would clarify some other items on your list that you spoke to blank about. The beginning of February last year, my kids had a soccer tournament in Mesquite. The day before we left, which was February 2nd, 2022, I tested positive for COVID. I have attached the picture of my test from on my counter in my kitchen from when I first found out. I sent it to my mom and blank to let them know because I was just around both of them. Eric was the coach of the soccer team, and I'm the annoying mom on the sideline that never stops yelling. We don't miss games or tournaments. We're a huge soccer family. When we found out I had COVID, I didn't want to miss the soccer tournament, nor did I want to get my kids sick. So I stayed at Casablanca. I didn't want to risk getting my boys ill during the tournament and them not play well. I brought a box of at-home tests with me to test every day so I could either join the boys, staying at my father-in-law's, or at least be with them during the game. Casablanca is about five minutes from the soccer field. Actually, here is a picture of the room number that I stayed in. I had taken a picture for my mom and Eric. I was still positive every day. Pictures attached. I would take pictures of my test to Eric and say, still positive. You can check Eric's phone for this. I stood on the sidelines wearing a mask and not interacting with anyone. Happy to get other soccer parents to attest to this. Eric had gotten COVID after we got home from Mesquite. You asked about any exotic vacations I've taken since Eric's passing. I went on two trips last year. One, my kids tried out at a soccer camp in South Carolina to qualify to play in Spain in June, and both my kids made it. So yes, I took them to Spain in October of 2022. I have attached their invitation letters. Also, Eric and I went to Mexico every year, sometimes twice. We traveled a lot. We have taken the boys to Mexico a few times, and we like to go in January. However, January of 2022, we could not go because Eric had his hunting trip to Mexico trip of two weeks planned, and it was too much that month. This is not new for us to go to Mexico or for us to go out of the country or on a vacation with our kids. I took my kids and my mom came with us in August of 2022 to Mexico. As I hope you understand, the months prior to this since Eric's death have been hard to deal with. No, I have never been to Key West or the Keys in Florida. However, my nanny went with her family in June of 2022, so maybe you have something mixed up. Eric's affair was the same year that I, quote-unquote, moved out. The trust was created as well as him looking into a divorce. I never actually moved out. I moved my clothes out one weekend to make Eric understand I'm not kidding about leaving him if he doesn't end things with blank. I did this on a Thursday or Friday while he was out of town. I was home by Monday. I never stayed another night at that other house. Eric and I figured things out like most couples do. Blank was her name. He changed her name in his phone so I wouldn't know about it, and honestly, we worked things out after that. I never went through his phone again to see if he changed it back, but you have his phone and can check. Eric and I went to counseling in Commas. We only went about four times, maybe. It wasn't for us. Blank and blank are the same person, as I'm assuming you know that. Ha ha, I'm also assuming blank told Woody that her husband got a call from him and gave all this information lol, yet he didn't ever go to talk to Detective O'Driscoll. Ironic how these things work. Mental health, yes. I got postpartum after my second child in 2014. Yes, I took medication for it. No, Eric and I did not have financial problems ever. Yes, Eric made more money than me. Do you make more money than your wives? Have I ever been financially reliant on Eric in the last five years? Absolutely not. Eric did not want me working because one, his first wife cheated on him with a guy at work. Eric wanted us to live the typical conservative life where the man takes care of his family and the wife is a homemaker. A wife and a mom, that's it. That is not my personality and not the way that I was raised. I am very independent. Even when I stayed home with my kids the first few years, I was in grad school for years because I wanted to do more and do more than be a homemaker, and I did. And when I did and started my business, it took some adjusting, but Eric and I were fine with it. We hired my nanny, and everything worked out. 
My nanny moved out because she was engaged and she and her fiancé were moving in together. That was always supposed to be temporary. She's worked full-time for Eric and I for years prior to his death. If anyone can tell you about our marriage, it's her. She lived it with us. Feel free to call her. Blank has already submitted her phone records to you to prove that your toll is incorrect. Blank will also be submitting hers over to you guys today or tomorrow. I am working on getting mine. However, Eric's business partner is not being cooperative, but you can call and ask for them and he would probably give them to you. I know what time I went to bed that night. There was no hole in my story. Hopefully by obtaining four phone record documentations, you guys can see this too. Happy to clarify or provide anything else you may need. I just want this over. I just want our lives back and to move on and grieve and mourn my husband without looking over my shoulder constantly for you guys or the idiotic private investigator or the Richens family. Whatever I can do to help close this out, just ask and I'll give you or tell you whatever you want to know. Please check with the lab on those gummies. P.S. Chad, I hear you also know our good friends blank. Their son and my son play on the same soccer team. When Eric passed, Blank took over coaching. You guys could even chat with them if you feel necessary. Signed, Corey Richens. So if all of that is true, that could give some insight into a lot of things regarding their marriage. First of all, if he was actually having an affair, that may have given her another motive besides money to poison him. I don't know, though, that that would exactly help her case. The fact that there wasn't any fentanyl found in their home kind of indicates that she put it in his drink secretly rather than him taking it and accidentally overdosing. You'd think if it were an accident that there would be the remnants of a baggie somewhere or some of it left over, but the fact that he had five times the lethal dose consumed makes me think that the entire baggie was dumped into a drink and that's why there was no evidence of it left behind and why the dose was so high because it was all ingested but also the fact that Corey got almost 60 pills is pretty crazy it's hard to imagine that she gave him all of those if eric really didn't want her working maybe he was controlling over their money which is why she was trying to change things around and prepare for a divorce even his friend said that he changed things only to get the last word in which seems pretty vindictive for two people who love each other. Regardless, I found it very interesting that just the detention hearing went that in-depth. You don't usually see that. I'm sure more will come out about the inner workings of their marriage and any potential affairs that could have played into this. Maybe Eric's sisters didn't know everything that was going on between them. Maybe he didn't want to tell them that he was having an affair, and he thought that Corey might kill him if she found out. I think there are so many directions that this case could go, and both sides seem to have pretty decent arguments. But I'm sure the prosecution has a lot more evidence and proof up their sleeves than what they've released in this first small hearing, because they're not required to release it all. A date for the preliminary hearing has not yet been set, but they are supposed to meet in court to set that date next week. I will definitely keep you guys posted and updated about everything going on with this case, and hopefully we can start to get to the bottom of what actually happened to Eric and who's responsible. After hearing all of this new information that came out this week and during the hearing, who do you believe? Do you think Corey is responsible? If so, what do you think her motive was? Or do you think that this could have been done by somebody else? Let me know in the comments below. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in with me today. Please don't forget to give this video a quick thumbs up on your way out. Press the subscribe button if you haven't done so already so that you will have my newest videos and updates on this case pop up in your YouTube homepage whenever you log on. It's a free way to support the channel as well. So just hit that little red subscribe button. All right, and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.